Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. We're going to return to our studies today. But before we do, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his protection, and for his blessing as we open his word and the words of his prophets. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you today to thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath and for the blessings of the week that are now past. We ask, Father, today that our minds may be open as we open your word, that we might understand your guidance, your admonition, and your warnings. Help us to recognize that which is going on right now around the world and that which is going on within our hearts. Help us now, Father. May your angels attend us. May those that are in this meeting join together in spirit and in truth to understand what you would say to us today. May your spirit assist us as well. For we need your wisdom. For it is only from wisdom on high that we may truly divide this word of truth. Guide us now each one. Help us in all that you would have us to learn. Be with us now. For those that are in this meeting, those that will view this later, help us to understand all that you would have us to understand. May your truth have an impact upon our minds, upon our hearts, and upon our beings. For this, Father, we ask, we thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Where we left off yesterday, or last Sabbath, excuse me, we have an admonition from Sister White. I have had the matter presented before me. If anyone is moved by the Spirit of God to publish a book which is adapted to supply a need, to advance the truth, and the selfish spirits work to bring the book under their control, then the men who conduct these matters have much to learn on this point. God says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Have we seen a point <clears throat> where studies have been attempted to be presented and others have chosen to want those studies to be under their control. What we are doing right now has been to examine our foundations. What we are doing has been necessitated by what we observed occurring on the 18th of July of 2020. Do any one of us in this, meet, in this meeting, in this movement, in the church have the ability or the right to decide what God is trying to say to us at this time and to stop a message from going forward.
No, we don't. And if we try something like that, we'd just be repeating what the government of Canada is doing now, arresting pastors and charging them and ticketing them. And it's general persecution as in Red China. No. <clears throat> well, you know, also, you know, Colin and Odilia have presented studies. And, and, uh, right. And those studies all need to be hear heard as well, right? So everyone's studies need to be heard. I'm not disagreeing. I, well, yeah, and what I'm saying is that nobody is, we're not seeking control over what other people are doing. In fact, you know, we're inviting them to present. So there's, there's a marked difference, you know, that we see uh, because there's these accusations that we're wanting to control the message. Right. But there's no evidence of that. No. <clears throat> As a question, was July 18th of 2020 a symbol for us to understand? It's definitely a symbol to understand. I mean, to understand July 18, 2020, um, just as the Millerites needed to understand October 22, 1844, what it meant. We have to understand what July 18, 2020 means. And, and in order to understand what it means, we need to have it connected to the past. Right. Clear, distinct lines. Okay. If we were to recall a bit of Bible history, Was there a point where a warning was given verbally and directly, and then a symbol was required, a, re a symbol was presented that was tied to a warning? Can we think of one? I'll give you an example, but it's not the one I'm thinking of directly. Was a warning given by Elijah to Ahab? Yeah, and it was attached to uh, uh, three years of no rain. Well, there, there's some with the Bible that would say that it was attached to three and a half years of no yeah, rain. Well, three and a half, yeah. Now, is there another one where a warning is given and it's attached to something that can be observed? Uh, I'm looking at uh, where the, the, the piece of cloth is uh, cut into two pieces. That's the meaning the division of uh, northern and southern uh, Israel, whereby uh, Jeroboam takes... Uh, 10 and Rehoboam takes two. Okay. Now that goes a little further, you know, back. But now is there is there another one that goes even further than this? Okay. This document, last Sabbath evening, was presented before me. Now, do we understand what is said in the title? Is the blood on the lintel? What are we talking about here? Passover? Exactly. Now, as we have been studying, all of these messages, whether we've looked at Hosea, whether we have been looking in Isaiah, whether we've looked at, at all of these different portions, as we have been looking initially at minor prophets, 
all of these other prophets got tied in. And they were being tied in to show us our great need of repentance. They were shown because a warning has been given. Now, this article has some very specific points that are very necessary for us to understand today. Now, this copy of the article, I made some notes within it. I am more than willing to be corrected on everything that's here. Now, as we dive into this, let's consider carefully what's being said said the directions that moses gave concerning the passover feast are full of significance and have an application to parents and children in this age of the world moses called for all the elders of israel and said unto them draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the passover and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts. The Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into in unto your houses to smite you. Now, this is Exodus 12, 21 to 23. And we are dealing here in the first day of the first month of 1533 BC. Would that be correct? So you're saying what's on the first day of the first month? Isn't the Passover on the first day of the first month? The 14th. 14th. 14th day of the first month. Okay, but the instruction for the Passover. Oh, the instructions are given? Yes. Yeah, I, I believe so. I believe that he's marking that as the this month shall be the beginning of months, right? Right. So they're going to start, and, and I assume, this is an assumption, that he tells them this at the beginning of the month. When, when the month begins, the first day of the first month. This is when this is told them, and that they're going to be told to get the, the lamb on the uh, the tenth day of the first month. Correct. So it has to be before the tenth day of the first month, at least. Uh, I mean, it could be after the month had started. Um, you know, it could be a few days in. But I think it's most likely that it's right at the beginning of the month. But that is an assumption. Okay doesn't specifically tell us it's the first day of the first month. But now <clears throat> Moses gives the instruction that as this Passover is to be prepared, the lamb that was selected on the 10th day of the first month is to be prepared in a specific way, and its blood is to be caught in a basin. As the blood is caught in this basin, the responsible party is to take hyssop and is to place a mark upon the two side posts and upon the lintel of the door. She continues, the father was to act as the priest of the household. And if the father was dead, the eldest son living was to perform this solemn act of sprinkling the doorpost with blood. This <clears throat> is a symbol of the work to be done in every family. Parents are to gather their children into the home and to present Christ before them as their Passover. The father is to dedicate every inmate of his home to God and to do a work that is represented by the feast of the Passover. It is perilous to leave in the hands of others. The peril is well illustrated by an incident that is related concerning a Hebrew family 
on the night of the Passover. The legend goes that the eldest daughter was sick, but that she was acquainted with the fact that a lamb was to be chosen for every family and that its blood was to be sprinkled upon the lintel and the side posts of the door so that the Lord might behold the mark of blood and not suffer the destroyer to enter in to smite the firstborn. With what anxiety she saw the evening approach when the destroying angel was to pass by. She became very restless. She called her father to her side and asked, Have you marked the doorpost with blood? He answered, Yes, I've given directions in regard to the matter. Do not be troubled, for the destroying angel will not enter here. The night came on, and again and again the child called her father, still asking, Are you sure that the doorpost is marked with blood? Again and again the father assured her that she need have no fear, and that a command which involved such consequences would not be neglected by his trustworthy servants. As midnight approached, her pleading voice was heard saying, Father, I am not sure. Take me in your arms and let me see the mark for myself so that I can rest. The father conceded to the wishes of his, of his child. He took her in his arms and carried her to the door, but there was no blood mark upon the lintel or upon the posts. He trembled with horror as he realized that his home might have become a house of mourning. With his own hands, he seized the hyssop bow and sprinkled the doorpost with blood. He then showed the sick child that the mark was there. Does this have relevance for us today? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find my button. <clears throat> no problem. Are the, pa are the parents placing the mark of God upon their household in this, their day of probation and privilege? Well, yeah. Are not, many, are not many fathers and mothers placing their responsibility into others' hands? Now, yes. Here again. I am one that is loath to point a finger because I realize I will always have three fingers pointing back at me. Do not many of them think that the minister should take this burden and see to it that their children are converted and that the seal of God is placed upon them. They do not restrict their children's desires, referring them to a thus saith the Lord. Many suppose that the Sabbath school influence will be all sufficient and that the Sabbath school teacher will instruct and educate their children in such a way as to lead them to Christ. Fathers and mothers place their responsibility in the hands of others and thus perilously neglect their own households. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, and every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him throughout the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. And come not near any man upon who is, whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. 
Then they began at the ancient men, the men of responsibility, which were before the house. Now, this is to be noted as occurring in Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6. And we noted this before as being the sixth year of the sixth month and the fifth day of the month. And I believe this is in 591 BC or approximately 942 years after the Exodus. Why is Ezekiel 9 being tied here with the story of the Passover? Was the Passover a warning? Well, it Absolutely. That without Christ, yeah, without Christ as our shield, we are lost. We're prey to the evil one. Can we tie the Passover and Ezekiel 9 to the first angel's message? Amen. So, <clears throat> all the way through the Bible, in Genesis, in Exodus, here in Ezekiel, we can see the elements of the warning message that is given to us in Revelation 14. Does anyone have a problem with this analogy? Are we agreed at this on this point? Brothers and sisters, this is a simple yes or no question. Are we agreed on this point that this, these examples, these literal examples that were given to the children of Israel before they left Egypt, this figurative example that is given to us in Ezekiel 9, are these not <clears throat> our warning for the time in which we currently live well, yes oh man this is the stealing time i am much distressed because there is such manifest neglect in the home in the matter of training the children and the youth even in professedly Christian homes where fathers and mothers would be supposed to be diligent students of the scriptures in order that they might know every specification and restriction in the word of God, there is manifest neglect of following the instruction of the word and of bringing up the children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Professedly Christian parents fail to pr practice piety in the home. How can fathers and mothers represent Christ's character in the home life when they are content to reach a cheap, low standard? The seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. I don't know about you, but I found that to be a very specific a very weighted warning. There are many today that believe the seal of the living God is going to be placed upon those that give lip service to the worship on the Sabbath. Does this statement contradict that understanding?
Yes. If parents would fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to be their strength, they would not fail of receiving his blessing in their households. Consider that sentence for a moment. <clears throat> where do we find the conditions where God has promised to be the strength of Israel? My premise for your consideration is that we find this in Exodus chapter 20, and it is tied with Leviticus 25 and Leviticus 26. Do you have a problem with that? <clears throat> For if we understand the law, and we understand the blessings and we understand the curses. <clears throat> Do these blessings not fall upon those that are dwelling in, in houses that are provided by God? Are we not able to receive his strength when we are willing to follow him and follow his law as it is written? Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, <clears throat> even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation, is a wise and an understanding people. For what nation is there so great? who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things that thine eyes have seen unless that they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy son's sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. When the Lord God said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 10. Now, as I understand it, this was written in approximately 1493 BC, about 40 years after they had left Egypt. By the way, does anybody know what the date today is? Cinco de Mayo. Really? No, 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 no. This is the sixth. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Coronation Day of Charles the Third. Really? An abomination. So, as a question, and this is an odd question. Is there anything that we could consider or draw from the date today? From May 6th? Right. I mean, it's, it's uh, 65. Right. The sixth day of the fifth month, 65. Do we ever see 65 anywhere else in the Bible as a warning? 
of Isaiah chapter 7. And who did that warning fall upon? It was warning Ahaz, who was the king of Judah, and the house of David, the leadership. Exactly. So we have, it. did, did it also not fall upon all of Israel, even the divided portion? Um, well, sort of. I mean, it was given specifically to Ahaz that northern Israel never received the message. Okay. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart, that thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou wait, walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and upon thy gates. Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 9. And also all that generation which were gathered unto their fathers. And there rose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. Nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them un into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Judges 2, 10 to 14. Now, chronologically, we place this about or after 1463 B.C. The reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that the generation rose up that had not been instructed concerning the great deliverance from Egypt by the hand of Jesus Christ. We've had to examine for ourselves the instructions that have been given so that we may more properly understand the warning that was provided for us on July 18th, there are many that are refusing to look to study this further, that are setting aside anything that has to do with numbers, that are setting aside anything that has to do with chronology. We cannot afford to forsake what Jehovah has instructed us. For if we do, we do it at our own peril. The fathers had not rehearsed to them the history of the divine guardianship that had been over the children of Israel through all their travels in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus had given special instruction from the pillar of cloud, bringing before parents the responsibility of teaching their children the statutes and the commandments of God. They were to present to their children tokens of the power of God and to perform ceremonies that would provoke inquiry and give them an opportunity of repeating the works of God in dealing with his people. But the parents failed to act the part of God had assigned them in diligently teaching their children so that they might have been intelligent in regard to the works of God in leading his people through the wilderness. Had the parents been true to their trust, the children would have seen the mercy and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the parents neglected the very work that the Lord had charged them to do and failed to instruct them in regard to God's purpose toward his chosen people. 
they did not keep before them the fact that idolatry was sin and that to worship other gods meant to forsake Jehovah. If parents had fulfilled their duty, we should never have the record of the generation that knew not God and were therefore given unto the hands of the spoilers. <clears throat> now that's an amazing paragraph. For here we had the opportunity to see that what we have seen recorded in the book of Judges need not have occurred had the children of Israel feared God and given glory to him. In the New Testament, we are exhorted to be warned by the example of the Hebrews in neglecting their duty and departing from the living God. Now, all these things happen unto them for ensamples, for they are written for what? For our admonition. And upon whom the ends of the world are come, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. The failures and the mistakes of ancient Israel are not as grievous in the sight of God as are the sins of the people of God in this age. That sentence that was just read, how do you take it? Well, those who have greater light bear greater responsibility. Thank you. That's very succinct. Does anybody have a problem with that statement? No. Here we are today. There are failures and mistakes that are ongoing within this movement. There are many of these that have been ongoing within the corporate church. When we choose to set aside the warning of the seven times, when we choose to set aside the warning of the daily, When we are choosing to say that Adam and Eve really didn't do anything wrong, as I've heard a pastor in an Adventist church present, we are not just making the same mistakes as ancient Israel. We are ignoring the light that has been given us all along the path. Light has been increasing from age to age, and the generations that follow are the example of the generations that went before. The Lord does not change, and a sin which he condemned in former generations should be avoided by us. Can we say this in any more blunt of a manner. If God doesn't change, if God changes not, as we observed in the book of Malachi, if he has condemned certain things as sin, for ancient Israel, are those not then sins to us today? We should heed the admonition that has been given in the past and lay hold of the promises that are made for the encouragement of the obedient. If we are learning lessons in obedience, following the path of faith and virtue, 
we have a living connection with God, and he will be our strength and support, our front guard, and our rearward. The same conditions must be fulfilled by us now as were by those who received rich blessings in the former days. The reason that we do not have more of the blessings of the Lord is that the professed people of God serve him with divided hearts as verily as did ancient Israel. That statement is a condemnation. What did Christ say in repeating Deuteronomy? <clears throat> We are to love God supremely. We are to love God with our whole heart. Here, if we, if we look at this directly, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with half thy heart. No. Oh, a uh, heart. Exactly. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Is that not love God supremely? Again, the reason we do not have more of the blessings of the Lord is that the professed people of God serve him with divided hearts, as verily as did ancient Israel. They profess to be worshipers of God, but many as verily worship idols, as did the Hebrews. Can a pastor, one that speaks using the radio in dulcet tones, can that pastor be an idol just as surely as an idol is made of gold, of silver, of wood or stone? With every generation, increased light has shown, and we are responsible for the use that we make of this light. Those who pretend to serve God and yet cherish selfishness, who seek to fill ambitious projects, are lovers of pleasures, lovers of self, and are as much more sinful than was ancient Israel as the light is greater that shines upon their pathway. They have had the past experience in the history of the disobedience of Israel, and they know the result of their neglect of duty. They have heard the warnings of God as to how to avoid the mistakes and the errors of his ancient people in order that they may escape the results of their own course of action. And they are more inexcusable in their course of sin than was ancient Israel. Consider that, brothers and sisters that there are those today that are more inexcusable, where they have had the example of the judges, where they have had the example of the house of Eli, and they have not turned from the practices that have brought them so low. Many feel astonished that the Israelites should have manifested such ingratitude when God had manifested such love and care for them. They think that they would not be guilty for taking such a course. But let the question be turned upon ourselves. In other words, don't go pointing fingers because you've got three pointed back at you. How much gratitude do we render to God for his loving kindness and his tender mercy? How easy it is for us to forget God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. We each come under the condemnation that rests upon ancient Israel 
when we neglect to give thanksgiving to God for his daily mercies to us. When the leper returned to give glory to God, Christ asked, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Is there only one in ten who returns to give glory to God? Is this the proportion who return with overflowing hearts to render praise and thanksgiving for the mercy and loving kindness of our Heavenly Father? What is the first angel's message? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him as the one who made the earth, the sea, and so on. Were there not ten cleansed? Let us recall that in the Millerite time, when it came time to recognize that October 22nd had been a sign of a different event, that there had only been 50 that chose to study. And from those 50, God was able to do a great work. We cannot pretend to serve God. We cannot give him half-hearted service. We have the greater light. <clears throat> this light has been shining upon the pathway. And yet, <clears throat> how many are there that are willing to accept this light? It was interesting to me <clears throat> that a copy of this article had been left on a table at a church that has not chosen to investigate any of the messages that have been being given. This message, this instruction given on the 21st of May of 1895 is as valid today as it was in the time in which it was first written. There is a disposition to grasp everything and to destroy individuality and ignore individual accountability, yet no compunction has thus far been aroused. How do we stand before God, brothers and sisters? Do we stand as a group? Do we stand as a church? Is the church as a whole going before the judgment seat of God? Or do we go individually? A state of things is coming in after the mold of men and not after the Lord's order. How would men see this? Would in the in the mind of man, is it not easier to criticize brothers and sisters that bring forth a message? A message that cuts, that hurts, but yet points very directly to our great need to fear God and give glory to Him. When the truth becomes an abiding principle in the soul, then we shall see the words of the prophet fulfilled. Instead of the thorn, the fir tree will spring up. 
instead of the briar, the myrtle, and life's desert will blossom as the rose. Here again, Isaiah 55, 13 and Isaiah 35, 1. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Christ came to seek and save those that were lost. He came to reach to the very depths of human woe and misery. He placed himself where he could reach the needy, the suffering, the oppressed, just where they were. And although to all appearances, they were the most unpromising. And with what interest, intense interest, did he work for them? What holy joy arose in his heart as he saw them opening their hearts to him, that he might, he might fill them with his transforming grace and imbue them with his spirit of self-denial and self-sacrifice. He came to honor humanity with the privilege of being participants in the blessings of his kingdom. He called upon men to repent of their sins, to receive his pardoning love, and unite with the world's redeemer in sowing the seeds of truth, laboring for the souls who are ready to perish. It is not possible to give to Christ more service than is his due. If you have, as had the Pharisees, a self-complacent spirit, if you wrap around your garments of your self-righteousness, and leave sinners in darkness and transgression. You give evidence that you are not converted. And those who you deem publicans and sinners will go into the kingdom of heaven before you. Those who would object to eating with publicans and sinners should closely criticize their own course of action. They have important lessons to learn. What saith the scriptures? To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Hosea 6, verse 6. How does the song go? What is it that we are to do? Are we not to do justice, to love mercy, and what? How are we to walk? Are we not told to walk humbly with our God? Uh, that's the idea. All right. In Hosea 6, 7, <clears throat> we have the translation before you, but the alternate reading, I think, is much more pointed. But they, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. In Job 31, 33, if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Are we to deal treacherously with God? Hosea 5, 7 states, they have dealt treacherously against the Lord. For they have begotten strange children. Now shall a mouth, a month devour them with their portions. We cannot afford to deal treacherously against the Lord. 
we cannot afford to be put into that type of category. Not now, not ever. Satan claims this world is his kingdom. <clears throat> Here he has set up his seat. But even amid the moral darkness, some light shines. God has a little flock. The people are not popular. For the world has chosen darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. But Christ says to his chosen ones, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. John 14, 15 to 17. So if we love Christ... What is our instruction? How will our heart respond? How was it just said? If you love me, keep my commandments. Yet there are those today that say that the commandments of Christ, the commandments of God are no longer applying to us today. They view the gospel as a message of grace, that the commandments have been set aside. If we choose to set aside the transcript of the character of Christ, Do we love him? Do we honor him? And do we fear him? If we set aside this love of Christ in keeping the commandments, are we entering into a covenant relationship with him? And as it says in the chat, a false gospel of total permissiveness, no accountability, and licentiousness. God's loyal and faithful children are found in a world where atheist and worldly religiousness abound. A world that ever since the day when Cain lifted up his hand against Abel has rejected every provision that heaven has made to restore the moral image of God in man. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Too many today accept this admonition and set aside the instruction of Christ. But even this gift has been cast aside as worthless. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? God asks. For your goodness is as a morning cloud. And as the early dew, it goeth away. Therefore, I have hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. I ask the question again. How can you enter into a covenant relationship 
if the commandments mean nothing. Are we then not choosing to deal treacherously against God if we set aside the commandments? Hosea 6, 8. Gilead is the city of them that work iniquity. And it is polluted with blood. Or as the alternate reading would state, that Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity, and it is cunning for blood. And as the troops of robbers wait for man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. Here, robbers are being compared with priests, and the priests are doing worse than the robbers. Because the priests are murdering in the way. May this not be said of us. Is it not the case that the priest is to teach that of God? and not of man. We are not to be as a company of priests that murder in the way, or murder in the way to Shechem. The priests have an individual responsibility just as much as the people have an individual responsibility. Now, here the situation was given a lot of references. As we're showing here, Gilead is a city of them that work iniquity. In Hosea 12, 11, is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. They sacrifice bullocks in, Gil in Gilgal. Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the field. And so the company of priests were seen by the translators as follows. In Jeremiah 11.9. Now, of course, 11.9 means nothing to us today, right? There's not a symbol here that we should pay attention with, is there? And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What kind of a warning do we see here? Whether we take this as September 11th or we take this as November 9th, Jeremiah says, and the Lord said unto him, the Lord said unto Jeremiah, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 22:25. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. And yet Hosea 5.1 and 5.2. Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken, ye house of Israel. Give ye ear, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. Verse 
we are to exhibit the character of Christ. Were these priests and these robbers exhibiting his character? I have seen an horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, he has set an harvest for thee when I returned the captivity of my people. Now, in the Hebrew, what does it mean when he's returned the captivity of thy people? What do we see here? The means to be released from captivity. Is that not what we seek right now is to be released from captivity? Yet Hosea is seeing this horrible thing in the house of Israel. That there is whoredom in Ephraim. And Israel is defiled. How could we apply this? figuratively today. Is this admonition from Hosea telling us that in order to avoid the whoredom of Ephraim, to avoid being defiled, that we need Miller's rules so that we are not accepting the training and the teaching of the world? Amen. Otherwise, if we, if we choose to accept the training and the teaching of the world, what kind of harvest are we going to have? This entire portion, this entire chapter, this book is calling us to repentance, as has many of that that we have been studying. If we have not been willing to repent and surrender the sins that we have allowed into our lives, how will we ever enter into a covenant relationship with Christ? How can we enter into the marriage supper with a stain or a wrinkle upon our garments? If we're going to hold on to our sins, if we're going to cherish our sins, how can we then fear God? And how can we give glory to him? Now, the last portion that Mrs. White brought together, saying that this was the condition of the world at the end of time, we find here. In the book of Joel, we have Joel declareth the destruction of the fruits of the earth by noxious insects. And by a long drought, he recommendeth a solemn fasting with prayer to depreciate those judgments. How many of us assembled today remember when this portion of the book of Joel was being examined by many in the movement? And how many of us remember what occurred when this was being brought out specifically. Well, I remember. 
So do I. Now, before we get into this, I will read what has been posted in the chat. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I am instructed to say that these words are applicable to the Catholic Church in the present condition. Review and herald. Nope, something. I... Repeat that, please. I'm sorry. Seventh day Adventists, the church, the people of the um, commandments and the spirit of prophecy. Exactly. I am instructed to say that these words are applicable to the Seventh day Adventist churches in their present condition. And this was written on the 25th of February, 1902. Gee, is there a symbol here? Do we see anything here? That's been picked up in the chat, but nobody else is seeing it. Wow. This admonition was given on the 25th day of the second month, 252 of 1902. Sorry, bro, it's, it's too small for me to see on my, on my phone. <laughs> okay, but <clears throat> can we make this up? No, you can't make this stuff up. I am instructed to say that these words are applicable to the Seventh-day Adventist churches in their present condition in 1902. If this was written in 1902, how much more does this apply to what we see today? As we recall the teaching before, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, now, I've been asked many times, why do I pronounce names like this, Joel, with the emphasis on the latter portion of the name? Whenever, um, go ahead. Because there are two names there. There is El, which is uh, Elohim, and uh, the first one. Exactly. And to whom are we referring when we recognize L? Are we not referring? God. Yes, we are referring to Elohim. So this word that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. How many generations are we referring to here? Do we not see four generations? That's, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, four. That which the palmer worm hath, le hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, 
hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. <clears throat> what was the battle that occurred here over this in the book of Joel? Do we remember? Can we recall? What, what do you mean? I mean, <laughs> the battle? Is that when what you did, said? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. <clears throat> I, I don't remember off the top of my head. What was the position that Elder Jeff took regarding the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar? Well, since there was four of them, uh, could it have been the... Uh, I'm not really remembering right. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of pulling this out of my pocket. Anyway, um, yeah, so Jeff Jeff applied these to, to Rome. <clears throat> How did the path of the just apply it? They applied it to Islam. How did they apply it to Islam? Um... Well, I'm not really quite sure how they how they did that. I mean, they looked at the locust, of course, as being Islam, and they had uh, they had different views on it, actually, um, from what I remember. There was a meeting that <clears throat> Kevin Howard and another party from the Path of the, of the Just attended in Arkansas. And Elder Jeff put before them very specifically that your view is coming from an old Protestant commentary. And they had to admit that he was correct. Their comment was, we'd hoped he would not know this. But he called them on it because they were choosing not to use Miller's rules. Does Father Miller ever instruct us to use commentaries of other people? Well, he doesn't. I mean, there is a use for commentaries to get background information, but not to embrace the text. Okay. But what they had done here was to make use of those commentaries rather than using line upon line. He chose to you they they chose to make use of a commentary to say, this is Islam, this cannot be Rome. In four generations, since 1863, we have been watching, sometimes shocked, most of the time with mouth agape, as the understandings of the pioneers were being destroyed one by one by one. Yeah, and they, they were primarily using, um, I believe, Albert Barnes, though I think Alexander Keith might have. I'm, I'm thinking the, the, the latter rather than the former. Right. Yeah, I mean, Albert Barnes, I think, is just repeating Alexander Keith's view. We have before us in this chapter 
something that's showing us the condition of the church as it stands right now. And we're seeing this same thing repeated within the movement. We are to be united. We are to be united in purpose. We are to be united in premise. We are to be united in prayer with all of our brothers and sisters. We are not to have a position that we are to condemn others, for we are not to judge. Here we have an issue. What went before in 2012 was a situation that a disagreement came up and this disagreement led to a split within the movement. But it's a very telling split because one side chose to follow Miller's rules and one side did not. Another point that's interesting here, though, is yeah. Jeff was still willing to have discussions on these things. Exactly. They weren't. Right. right. Everything was on their terms. And since Jeff was unwilling to accept their view, they shut him out. How telling is that for us today? That gets to the root of it. Brothers and sisters, the character of Christ was one that even when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came at him with very pointed comments, Christ was willing to hear them out, but they were not willing to hear Christ. They believed that they themselves were completely correct and that they could cast out any that did not directly agree with them. Did we not see that in the example that's given to us in John 8 with the woman that was brought before Christ caught in the act, the very act of adultery. Right. St uh, standard operational procedures throughout the histories. So anytime that we have a situation like this occurring, whether it has to do with the book of Joel whether it like the woman in John 8 or this that we are given as an example within the Millerite time, all of these examples, these end samples are given for our admonition that we are to learn more to become like Christ. If we are not willing to become like Christ, then who, whose character are we then going to represent? Oh, the other guys. Okay. So, Kayser quoting Keith's ideas? Yeah, this is just, um, Ale he's quoting Alexander Keith. Okay. But I'm trying to find Alexander Keith's commentary on Joel. <clears throat> We're given a choice today. 
the choice is whose banner are we going to un to stand under? As Mrs. White presented this, we can either stand under the black banner or we stand under the bloodstained banner. I'm going to put it to you more simply. Where is the blood today? Is the blood in the basin waiting for someone else to put it on the standards and the lintel? Or have we placed the blood as we have been instructed to do so that we identify ourselves so that the avenging angel will pass us by. The lentil thing? Yep. <laughs> so we have to decide for ourselves who we are going to serve. Membership in the church does not come with privileges. Membership in the church does not ensure our salvation. Membership in the church is not our passport to eternity. My heart has been heavy for there are many that had stood within this movement that have made the decision that their salvation is found only within the corporate church. Yet this is not what Sister White has presented. Nowhere does she say that salvation is the church's responsibility. But many places, she states that salvation is an individual responsibility. Do you have other questions or comments with what we have just covered today? So membership in the church is not a free pass. It is a responsibility that you incur when you become a Christian. Um, you have to, uh, there's, what is it? You have responsibilities to do certain works that when right. called upon, just like all the priests did. You know, uh, the example was um, John's daddy, right? Okay. He goes, he goes to, he, it's his time, his chosen time. He goes in uh, and, and does what he has to do, which I believe it was the incense. And um, that's when the angel of the Lord came down and, and um, gave him the message that he did. But the whole point of this was that we have our, our responsibilities to do what we're supposed to do when we're called upon. Right. Which could be many, many things. Are we willing to take up our responsibilities? Are we willing to take up our cross? Are we willing to follow Christ <clears throat> no matter what the cost? This is the questions that I will leave with you today. If there's no other question or comment, then let us close with prayer. Loving Father in heaven, there is a burden that is to be placed upon all of us. Yet there is a promise 
that you have made. Come unto me, ye that are laden and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Help us, Father, to understand the rest that you are promising. Help us to go forward, Father, to know that which you would have us to do. We are coming to you because the burdens that we have chosen are grievous. You have said that your burden is light. Help us to accept that light burden, the burden that you have already carried. You know the way, you know the steps, you know the path. Help us now to understand and be guided by you on the path here and the path to your kingdom to come. For this, we thank you and this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.